<laughs> okay, um, thank you very much for your patience. I think we'll, we'll get started. Um, apologies to Alice, we had some uh, technical problems as well. Um, so it's my pleasure and honour to introduce our speaker for today, Alice Mitchell um, from the University of Bristol. Um, and prior to that was a postdoc at uh, University of Hamburg in Afghanistic, working on Datoga, which we'll be hearing a little bit about today. Um, Alice has a PhD from... State University of New, uh, New, York, of New York at Buffalo, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, worked with a colleague that many of us know, Jeff Good, um, and very uh, glad uh, to say this as well. Before that, um, Alice is from SOAS, so yes, homegrown uh, speaker today. So Alice did her uh, MA here in the LDD MA between 2009 and 2010. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I know she's going to talk to us a little bit about um, some of her research, and then if we have time, a little bit about some of her present research as well, or maybe in the question and answers and yeah. discussion time afterwards. So yes, yeah. thank, thank you. Alice, thank you. Thanks very much, Hannah. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the linguistic expressions that we use to refer to people, um, otherwise known as person reference, in the Togo, which is a Nilotic language spoken in Tanzania. Um, and I'm going to start off with um, a clip of a recording I made last year um, in which some speakers try and establish reference to someone and it's quite difficult so they take a while and there's lots of person referring expressions so it's quite a nice example for that reason. Um, so this recording was made in um, a woman's house, the senior wife of this particular compound and you're looking into her sitting room which is the kind of public room where she receives guests these are two young relatives of hers who are visiting from um, another compound and the woman herself is sitting in another room so they're talking through the wall um, so the recording quality isn't, isn't great um, for her because I didn't have an extra microphone and um, another person comes to the door and greets the woman again through the wall and she doesn't know who he is, she can't see him so she asks and then um, we, we see an exchange full of personal referring expressions. So I'll just switch to... Uh, a rough transcript of the conversation that you just heard. All you really need to pay attention to is the, the English translation on the right hand side. So I've started the transcription where, um, where the woman asked who, who is it standing at the door um, and the young man inside tells her it's Ginyengid mother. Um, so, so gives the name of the person. Now this doesn't mean anything to the woman um, so she needs some additional information. She asks for his clan um, and, he, and he answers Bajuta. This also doesn't help her much. So she then asks Ginyangida um, Gabanya, which literally means Ginyangida of whom? So who is your father? That's the conventional way of asking that. Um, and then instead of responding to that, the Ginyangida outside um, asks, is the elder of the house at home? So he's looking for the head of the household who's not currently in. And the young man um, inside tries to answer the question of who Ginyangi's father is, but he has some trouble. That one of, of that person, what's, his, what's he called? God, I've forgotten. Ginyangi of. And then Ginyangi answers of Gidagutid. Okay, so he's, she's now got his father's name as well. Um, the young man inside repeats it again of Gidagutid. 
he still doesn't, she still doesn't acknowledge any recognition of who this is. So he continues, don't you know that Ginyangid of Gidagutida, Gidagutida Bajuta, um, and gives her a little bit more information, another person referring expression about the father now, the one who used to live here at Gulewen. Um, and then she tries and thinks, oops, um, was it was it some was it the child who came here the other day? Was that who this person is? No. Finally, they give up on trying um, to get her to understand who's standing at her door and start talking about something else. Um, so this is a nice example that this is Ginyan Gita himself. Um, this this tells us a, a, a little something about person reference in Datoga. So the the first strategy um, was the name. So the birth name was used when she asked, who is this? Um, she was told, it's Ginyangid. Okay. When this didn't work, we then saw the centrality of kinship for identifying um, who someone is. So this is uh, to be expected in a small scale society like this one. And he was identified by relations of descent. So he was um, positioned within a clan, Bajuta, and um, she was told his father's name. So we can see it's a patrilineal society. Um, and when none of this information worked either, we got an insight into some other important facets of, of how to identify someone. So we got some information about where his father lived. Um, and then also she tried to establish how she might know him. So referred to an earlier meeting. Um, now, what's the reason that this, um, this short interaction has so many person referring expressions is because she can't see him, right? Humans are amazingly good, or most of us, at um, doing facial recognition, right? We, in face-to-face -face interaction, we don't have to figure out who someone is because we know from looking at them. And in this case, she couldn't, so she had to rely on language to help her figure out who Ginyan Gid was. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of nice example with lots of person referring expressions, but um, it's also specific to that context. So if a young woman had come to the door or if an elder had come to the door, the ways in which they would have um, identified this person would have been different. So the interactional and the interpersonal context, of course, affects how person reference is achieved. Um, so uh, why is any of this interesting? You may be wondering, why should we study person reference? So talking about other people is one of the major functions of language. Um, we do it all the time. And so we would expect that there are specialized lexical and grammatical resources um, in languages to do so. And we find um, a reasonable amount of cross-cultural variation in um, strategies for person reference. So we find variation in pronominal systems, um, the existence or non-existence of honorific systems and their complexity. Um, variation in naming systems and naming practices. So person reference is a really interesting topic from the perspective of sociolinguistic diversity. And it's a really important topic for pragmatics. It's been particularly prominent um, in the politeness literature. And recently, um, researchers have been trying to look at cross-cultural principles underlying person reference more generally, and I'll talk about that in a second. For linguistic anthropology and anthropology more generally, um, person reference is an amazingly rich source of information about how different communities categorize people, right? So whether they think about this in terms of gender, kinship, profession, age, status, or whatever. So looking at nice little interactions like the one we just saw tells you a lot about social categories across cultures. Um, and also how people use language to negotiate their social relationships, so how they position themselves relative to each other. Um, so to, in, in short, reference to persons is a fundamental phenomenon at the intersection between language and social structure. Um, and researchers have proposed two universal pragmatic principles thought to underlie person reference. Um, this is mostly coming out of the conversation analysis literature. So these two principles are recognition and economy. So recognition, um, people use expressions they think their interlocutors will understand. <laughs> um, so this is, could be kind of subsumed under the cooperative principle. As a speaker, you think about what your interlocutor knows and you um, choose your linguistic expressions accordingly. And the second principle, economy, means using as minimal a form as possible. Um, so you're more likely to use a first name than a first name plus last name in some context. And 
uh, researchers have noticed that recognition always takes precedence over economy. So the most important thing is to get someone to know who you're talking about, even if actually you end up having to say it a lot, like um, in the example we just saw. So if you think about this example of Ginyangida, the initial question, who is this person, was answered very economically. We just got a first name. Um, but then when the woman didn't understand who the reference was to, we got a lot of elaboration. So um, these two principles are a good start for a theory of reference, of person reference, but they make no reference to interpersonal or relational dynamics, right? So how does social status um, and the relationship between the interlocutors affect person reference forms? And that's what I'm really interested in. Um, and so far, our theory doesn't really tell us anything about that. So Levinson introduced um, or suggested a third principle, which he calls circumspection. Um, which he defines as follows, shows circumspection by not over-reducing the set of reference explicitly. Um, and he talks about this in the context of his field language, Jeligne, um, where he says people often avoid names, they prefer to use more generic expressions like in terms um, or descriptions. So you, are, you show circumspection um, by not pinpointing a reference precisely with a name. Um, Okay, I just wanted to say a little bit about um, how I got interested in this topic and what my, what my goals are for this <coughs> research, which is very much in progress at the moment. Um, so I think many of us who've worked with languages spoken in small-scale societies have probably um, been drawn to you know, the, the topic of person reference. It's, it's very salient in societies where people have multiple names and you kind of have to figure out which name is being used at which time. Um, and also, often there are very strict rules about how to refer to someone, and if you get it wrong, you know, it's, it's really bad. Um, so I wrote my uh, PhD on de toga in-law name avoidance practices. I'm going to talk about this uh, quite a bit more later on, but um, I'll just briefly summarise here. So if you're familiar with Lonipa, it's a very similar phenomenon in de toga, where women avoid the names of their senior in-laws, and also words that sound similar and related words. So there's very extensive um, name avoidance going on. So when you study this kind of thing, you can't fail to be struck by you know, the social significance of person reference and even the metaphysical significance. So if you refer to someone with the wrong expression, you're not only offending the living, but you're potentially offending the dead as well, which will have consequences. So, my goal um, in looking at person reference is to understand the broader context of naming, addressing and referring in which in-law name avoidance operates. So I'm very interested in kind of cross-cultural typological study of person reference, but I'm looking at it through this lens of avoidance. Um, so what can person reference more generally tell us about avoidance specifically? Uh, oh yeah, and this picture was here just to remind me to say something about gesture. So gesture is um, one really important way in which we do person reference. So this guy was referring to this person. He said this person pointed. Um, I'm very much interested in multimodal aspects of person reference. I'm not going to talk about that today though. But that was just in case Mandana picked me up on that. <laughs> okay, so um, before I get on to talking about person reference in a bit more detail, um, I'll tell you a little bit about who the Toga people are, a bit about their language. So the Toga are traditionally semi-nomadic pastoralists. Um, this lifestyle, for, like for many pastoralists, has become increasingly difficult um, and they've had to resort to some agriculture, so they now grow maize and beans um, and their herds are getting smaller and smaller as it becomes more difficult to find sufficient land for grazing their cattle. Um, they are patrilineal, patrilocal, so women go to live with the husband's family when they marry, and polygynous society. And um, despite a lot of recent changes in their economy, cattle are still of central importance. So it's kind of what you could call a classic cattle complex society. Uh, cattle are important not only in terms of wealth, but also culturally um, and socially. Um, given all of what I've just said about you know, the, the, the difficulties faced by pastoralists. Um, there are high levels of poverty among the Toga, and they're relatively marginalized within Tanzania. So um, people have either not heard of the Toga often when, I'm, when I tell people about my, to Tanzanians about my research, or they're like, why would you study that language? Um, so yeah, relatively marginalized people, which 
also means they have retained quite a lot of their traditions as well. Um, so nowadays, so traditionally Tanzania, um, the Togo occupied uh, quite a large part of northern Tanzania. Nowadays they're spread all over the place. You can find them um, in, around Morogoro. Yeah, I think you can find them even as far south as Mbeya um, in the search for, for pasture. Um, my research is based in Manyara region, um, in Mbulu district specifically, and I've worked in several different villages um, within that district. So just a few words about the language itself. Um, Dotoga is a Nilotic language, belongs to the Southern Nilotic subfamily, um, so closely related to the Kalenjin languages of Kenya. And it's actually a cluster of dialects. Um, there's thought to be seven dialects. There's not a huge amount of research on um, mutual intelligibility yet, but the dialects that I've been working on predominantly are Gisam, Janga, and Barabai Dotoga. Speaker number is quite uncertain. The most recent estimate by the Languages of Tanzania project was 140,000 speakers, although I think it's probably quite a bit higher than that, actually. Um, in terms of documentation, there's a little bit. So there's a sketch grammar by Franz Hotland um, in his big book on the Southern Nilotic Languages. Uh, and there's um, quite a few good articles by Roland Kiesling at the University of Hamburg as well, but, but not much more than that currently. Okay, um, I'm going to give you a very brief typological overview. Um, so basic word order in Totoga is VSO. Um, this, this utterance in one, Mudulan, has brought flower. We've got the verb followed by the subject followed by the object. But actually, word order is really flexible. So VOS, SVO, SOV, and OVS are all attested in my corpus. So um, word order seems to be pragmatically conditioned um, and very, very flexible. Um, as you will have noticed, it's a tonal language. Um, we don't know a ton about the function of tone in Totoga yet. But one really important thing is that it marks grammatical relations. Um, Kiesling has showed that it's a marked nominative language. So um, the basic tone is the accusative tone, and then to put nouns in the nominative case, you change, you change the tone pattern. It's an agglutinating language, so it's got extensive inflectional and derivational morphology on nouns, but particularly on verbs. Um, and Kiesling's identified five different suffix slots on the verbs with functions like detransitivizing suffixes, proactional motion of various different kinds, um, and applicative suffixes. So, Here's an example just to illustrate the use of one of these suffixes. In number two, you've got um, a sen sentence that means, I avoid my father-in-law. And then um, in three, we've added the, uh, what Kiesling calls the anti-passive, so um, removes the object. You've got um, that suffix there, so that turns it into um, a sentence meaning, I avoid or I practice avoidance. And as you may be able to spot, we've also got things like vowel harmony going on. So um, rich, rich morphology in this language, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, in terms of language contact, it's actually surprisingly easy to find monolingual Totoga speakers. Um, quite unusually for Africa, there are many, many, many monolinguals. Um, the area that I work in, so this is uh, a map of the Rift Valley area. Um, the most likely second language would be Iraq which is the Cushitic language, or Swahili, if, um, if the person's been to school. And, and most Totoga will know simple Swahili. OK, so moving on now to strategies of person reference in Totoga. I'm going to start by looking at the most circumspect or the most indirect um, ways of referring. So I'm going to start with pronouns, then look at um, descriptions, then kinship terms, and then finally we'll look at names and name avoidance. Um, so Totoga has um, quite a simple system of independent pronouns. Um, relative dis re relevant distinctions are just um, person and then number, singular or plural. Um, and then it also has a set of pronominal prefixes, um, which are slightly different in that there's no number distinction in the third person. So independent pronouns are optional. So it's a so-called pro-drop language. Um, so where they do occur, it seems to um, emphasize the, uh, the third person. For example, in number seven, and he was hiding inside, um, we've got a third singular 
um, pronoun there, but but much more commonly, um, there's no there's no independent pronoun. Um, with person reference, most of the time people are just going to use. They're not going to have um, explicitly expressing the person. They just rely on the pronominal prefixes. So um, here's an example from my corpus. A grandmother asks her grandson, where is Sagerlan, which is the name of his mother. So he uses a name in initial reference. And then the subsequent reference, you only have a um, phenomenal prefix. She's in that house. OK. Um, so slightly less uh, or slightly more um, direct strategy of person reference is to give a description of the person that you're referring to. Um, so you might use a word like elder or woman or uh, child, for example. Um, so in the extract at the beginning, um, you might remember that Ginyang Gid said, is the elder of this house at home? So in referring to the head of the household, he chose to use um, a sort of generic noun, elder, modified by um, of this house, um, rather than using the elder's name. Um, and this use of word word for elder is very common. Women use it to refer to their husbands very frequently, or if a neighbour comes to visit, um, they'll say, is the elder at home, like, like we see in this example. Um, so we can explain this kind of use in terms of Levinson's circumspection principle. So it's um, the set of possible references uh, included in elder is a lot broader than if Ginyang Gid had used the elder's name, for example. Um, so it's a more indirect, circumspect way of referring to someone, and it's very common. Um, okay, another example of a kind of generic noun would be the noun for person, seed, which is often used um, to refer to people. So again, it's achieving respect through indirectness. So in this example, um, this is actually from the, the recording that I showed you, so the, the young man um, sitting by the camera said, come on, let's talk, the person is recording, which is very thoughtful of him. <laughs> um, so he could have referred to me as the white person or the woman um, or your guest, but he just said the person, right? And that's very common. Um, so again, we're seeing um, circumspection seems to be underlying that kind of generic noun use. Um, so the nice thing about descriptions is that they allow you to be creative, right? Kinship terms, names, you can't be super creative, but descriptions you can be. Um, and often descriptions are used as a way to be ironically indirect. So um, this utterance comes from an example where there were two women talking and um, one of the women had expected the other woman to bring her some soap the previous week and she had failed to do this. Um, so the woman who was expecting the soap said, I didn't meet the girl with the black mark under her eye at home, at my home. Um, and her addressee, the one who's supposed to bring the soap, has quite a visible um, dark colored birthmark under her eye. So um, she's obviously referring to her addressee, but she does it indirectly rather than saying you um, or using her name and um, kind of makes a pointed jibe at her, at her addressee by by coming up with this creative um, way of referring to her. And I'm sure we can all think of tons of examples in English too where, where, where we use this kind of indirect, ironic indirectness. Um, okay. So another common form of person reference is to use a kinship term. Um, I'm not gonna go through the entire kinship terminology, but um, here's a straightforward example. Um, where someone was referred to just as his son. So they'd already established reference to the father and they talk about, uh, talk about his son only, only in this way. So um, with a kinship term and a possessive suffix. Um, so you refer to someone just by positioning them within the kinship system. Um, and there's lots of reasons that you might do this. So in some cases, it doesn't actually matter who the person is. In this example, um, some elders were talking about a man's funeral and um, they were just commenting that his son was far away. It didn't really matter who this person was. It was just that his son, he should have, should have been at the funeral. Um, another reason you might use kinship terms is um, 
you know, like in our Guinea and Guinea example, you're just trying to identify someone. Um, or you might be practicing circumspection again. So one common um, way of referring to people in Datoga, and like many African languages, is to use a technonym. So mother or father, and then the child's name. Um, so this is more circumspect in that you're not, you don't name the person directly, you name them via a relationship to their child. Um, and kinship terms are often a good option in case of forgetting someone's name. So there's quite a bit of psychological research on how we're terrible at remembering names. Um, there's something weird about names. Uh, and here's an example from an elder. So I'll just read the English. He's trying to pinpoint someone, that elder, that elder, the elder gr who growled here, who was the father of the wife of God, what was his name? And then finally he remembers, Leku. Okay, so he'd used, well, a couple of different strategies. That elder who grew old here came first. Then he tried to um, fix him in the kinship system and then finally remembered his name. Um, okay, so moving on now to the most direct way of referring to someone. Um, I'm going to talk about names as person referring expressions. So in the literature, names are considered the most efficient form of recognition, of, of person reference. They fulfill both the principles of recognition and economy. They're short and they should establish reference pretty quickly. Um, like we saw was attempted in the Guinea and Guinea example. Um, so that's all well and good, but what about in a society where people have lots of different names? Um, which name do you use? Um, and this is true for Jatoga. Um, so I'll just describe to you some of the, some of the different names. Um, first of all, we've got birth names, um, which is the name given to a child um, shortly after they're born. And again, as in many African languages, it um, describes some circumstance of the child's birth. So um, with our Ginyangid example, for, for example, that comes from the now Nyangid wedding. So that child was born um, during a wedding or around the time of a wedding. So, uh, so that's the birth name. And often people have more than one birth name. If your grandfather names you something and your mother names you something else, you might continue to, to have both of those names throughout your life. Um, the second, probably most uh, um, uh, most important name after the birth name is what I call the domestic name. It's literally called the children's name in Datoga. Um, but that's kind of confusing in English. So this is a name which children can use to address adults, including their own parents. Um, but it's also used among adults of the same compound um, and neighbors and relatives. So that's why I call it a domestic name. Women receive this name when they get married. Um, and there seem to be a smaller set of possible names than with the birth name. So the birth name, you can really be called anything. Um, whereas domestic names, there's quite a few that you hear regularly. So for example, um, Damongan is, means guinea fowl, so it's something that's seen to be beautiful. Um, sometimes women are named after some circumstance of the marriage. So this, I like this one, Majurju means she didn't hurry, so she wasn't in a rush to uh, arrive, for example. <laughs> Um, and often the names have a form that seems to be so that it's easy for a child to say. So you get names like La La, Ye Ye, um, Jia Chi, this kind of thing. So women, there's kind of an appointed time when they're given the domestic name. Men, it, there's no formal occasion on which they get named. It can happen at any time when the name is felt to be necessary. So um, if a man gets married, and his younger siblings no longer feel like calling him by his birth name, they come up with a domestic name. Then there's the marital name, which um, is only for women, and this is given at the same time as the domestic name. Um, in Jatoga, literally, it's the husband's name, and this is a name that a husband can call his wife um, and a husband's brothers, but no one else, unless they're joking. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we have technonyms as well, so this is very common to refer to an adult, you'll say mother of Guinea and Guid, um, or father of Guinea and Guid. So those are the main types of names, and then there are others too. So some people have Christian names. Um, adolescents give each other names as well. Um, a mother-in-law will give a son-in-law a special name that lasts only one day. So there are other names, but these, these ones here in bold are um, the most important. Um, Okay, so clearly there's a lot more going on than just recognition and economy in, in person reference. Um, otherwise, everyone would only have one name. Um, so how do people choose which name to use when? Um, 
Well, I've already talked about this a little bit. So as a child, you're going to use a domestic name rather than a birth name. Um, only husbands and their brothers are going to use the marital name, no one else. Um, do that. And another um, major reason that you wouldn't use a birth name is because you are somebody's daughter-in-law or your junior female in-law. Um, and for you, then, the birth names of your in-laws are completely taboo. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more now. So, um, like in many, many, many societies across the world, um, both men and women practice some kind of avoidance towards their in-laws. For women, it's far more extensive than for men, um, partly probably because women live with their husband's family. So they practice um, physical avoidance, uh, avoidance of eye contact, all this kind of thing, not touching father-in-law's belongings. And they also practice an extensive kind of linguistic avoidance. So de Togo women avoid three kinds of words. So they avoid the names of their senior in-laws. And as I've said, names are all meaningful and derive from ordinary words. So they also avoid the words from which the names derive. And they avoid near homophones of the names. Um, so I'll just give you an example. Let's say your father in, father in law is called Gida Ropt. Ropt means rain, so it was born while it was raining. Um, if that's the name of your father in law, you're going to avoid the name, regardless of the bearer of that name. So if your brother happens to also be called Gida Ropt, you can no longer use that name. You're going to avoid the noun for rain um, and word forms of that lexeme. And you're going to avoid, for example, the word robadid, which sound, sounds too similar to the name. So you're going to avoid mere homophones. Um, so this isn't just you know, one or two names that women are avoiding. It's um, quite an enormous set. The exact set of people that you avoid varies, on, um, varies from household to household. But the maximal set described to me was um, three ascending generations of in-laws. So your father-in-law and his brothers, grandfather-in-law and his brothers, uh, great-grandfather-in-law and his brothers. And remember, this is a polygynous society, so there are lots of brothers. Um, also mother-in-law and her sisters, and then um, a couple of other kinship categories too. So you're potentially avoiding dozens and dozens and dozens of names and all um, the words that you consider to sound similar. So what do women do um, in the face of all these taboos? Well, over time, women have developed a special conventionalized avoidance vocabulary with alternative words for anything that they might need to avoid. Um, so for example, if you can't say rain, roped, you can say gir uh, And everyone, pretty much everyone will know that that's an avoidance word and means rain. Um, the origin of the word gir is not known, but often there's quite a transparent relationship between um, the avoidance term and, the, and its ordinary counterpart. So for example, if you can't say snake, then you can say long animal. Um, if you avoid the word for water, you can use this term, which means something like coldness derives from the adjective cold. Um, usually there are multiple avoidance um, equivalents for a single word because this might be taboo for you too, right? This might sound like the name of your mother-in-law, for example. So as you can see, concerns about how to refer to other people um, have a massive impact on women's speech, um, even when they're not actually referring to a senior in-law. Um, so I had a video for you which is not going to play because of our technical issues. Um, this was an example where two women are talking. This woman, so they live in different villages. Um, this woman asks her whether she's had rain in um, her area and avoids the word for rain, uses that form you just saw, good, good, and this woman replies, um, no, we've not had rain. Now she uses the ordinary word for rain, right, because it depends, your avoidance patterns depend on the names of your in-laws. Okay, um, so this kind of very extensive name avoidance where you also have near homophone avoidance is unusual, but, um, oh, sorry. But there are um, a couple of other documented cases elsewhere in Africa. So the best known example is Lonipa um, in Osa and, and Zulu. We also find very similar phenomenon, I mean, incredibly similar, it's really striking, uh, in several Highland East Cushitic languages of Ethiopia. Um, it's very similar again, phenomenon in Yakusa, Bantu language of Tanzania, which is not in contact with the Toga. Um, and then outside of Africa, um, it's also been documented in Mongolian, um, although no longer, no longer found there. 
Uh, all of these societies are patrilineal, patrilocal, most of them are also pastoralist, but the historical relationship between them all um, is unknown at this point. So how do women refer to in-laws whose names are taboo then? Um, well, there's several different options. Um, so there are what are called avoidance names. Um, so the conventionalized avoidance vocabulary that I told you about, you can just use that to switch, um, for example, roped in someone's name with gir gir, and then you get an avoidance equivalent of the name, and that's OK. You, you can then refer to your father-in-law with that name. So that's one option. Um, and that's what you're also going to do in that example I gave you where your brother also happens to have the same name as your father-in-law, then you'll refer to your brother with this avoidance version of the name. Um, another option is to use the domestic name. Um, so that's the, um, the name that's used by children. Um, so for example, this is an utterance from my corpus. A daughter-in-law refers to her father-in-law with his children's name. Jajid, and that's completely fine. Okay, so it's only the birth name that's taboo. Um, and you might also use kinship terms. You can say my father-in-law, or generic nouns. You might use like the elder, for example. Um, so, if we think about the kinship terms and the generic nouns, so saying something like my father-in-law. We can use Levinson's circumspection principle to account for that. Um, but with avoidance names and domestic names, which are the more common um, way of referring to a taboo in law, these are still names. Um, a domestic name is surely just as direct and specific as a birth name. So this idea of using a more generic uh, term doesn't really hold up in the case of name avoidance. Um, so we might think then, well, are certain names more circumspect or more indirect than other names? Um, you know, if I call Hannah Dr. Gibson, I'm being more circumspect than, um, than if I say Hannah, possibly. Could we think of a continuum um, to explain, you know, the domestic name is somehow a little bit more circumspect than a birth name? But actually, I don't think this really works for de Toga. The domestic name is quite personal, it's quite affectionate. It's the name that, that you use to refer to someone on a day to day basis at home. Um, so I think there's something, some difference between um, a birth name and other kinds of names that, that we can't really capture with this idea of circumspection. Um, so I think we need to draw a distinction between circumspection and name tabooing. So circumspection would be a pragmatically conditioned avoidance of names as a whole class of words, where you're avoiding actually just naming as a strategy, as opposed to name tabooing where you have a prescriptive avoidance of a particular kind of name, so in this case a birth name. Other names are fine, right? It's only the birth name, there's something special about the birth name. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm interested in looking at person reference to try and better understand name avoidance, um, to understand the broader context of uh, naming and referring. So one way to think about this might be to ask if a community has major name tabooing practices like, like Datoga, um, do speakers also practice circumspection with respect to names? Is there kind of more general avoidance of names as a thing uh, in addition to name tabooing? Um, and I, I started looking at this in a very preliminary way, and I'll, um, this, is, this, is, this is all still a work in progress. So I took that single recording um, that you saw in the beginning, the clip from, um, it's only 20 minutes. 1,600 words, and I coded the person reference strategies in that recording. And I only included third person um, and specific reference. So often people talk about people in general. I didn't include those. It was only um, when they were specifically pinpointing someone. Um, so here's some descriptive statistics about what I found. So unsurprisingly, um, the vast majority, well, actually you know, less than half, of the person referring expressions were <laughs> pronominal markings, so that's not surprising, right? And most of these probably occur in subsequent mention to a person, so you establish that you're talking about Ginyang Gid, and then maybe you talk about him for a minute, and every single um, reference after that is just going to rely on, on pronominal marking on the verb. But then we see that descriptions, or generic nouns, or NPs, are the next most common strategy. Okay, so almost a quarter of person referring expressions are descriptions. 
Um, names are not used a great deal. So uh, of the 219, there were 35 names used as personal referring expressions. And kinship terms were used even less, which might have just been the topic of this particular conversation. Obviously, I would need to do this over a much larger sample. Um, but this does suggest that um, names might be being avoided in favour of descriptions, that there might be this kind of broader pattern of circumspection um, in the society. So as I said, um, I'm planning to do this over a much larger sample of my corpus. And the other thing I want to do is break down this name category, so which name is being used when. Um, you know, we might find that actually of those, most of them were domestic names, not birth names, and then we really might have a nice pattern for gen more general avoidance of names. Um, okay, tying up. Uh, so I hope to have shown that person reference is a really rich topic for exploring language and social organisation, um, especially so in Ditoga. Recognition and economy, these two principles that have been proposed, um, we can see that they are at play in the Toga person reference, but there's so much more that's going on um, and that we need to explain. Levinson's principle of circumspection, which was kind of an addition to these two initial principles, is certainly useful and it was um, it helped us understand why people would say elder, for example. Um, but as currently formulated, it can't explain in-law name avoidance um, because people are still using names. It's not, it's not that names are a problem, it's a specific kind of name. So there's something special about a birth name. Um, I have some ideas about what that is, but I don't have a good handle on it. So the birth name is called the big name in Datoga. Um, it's the name that accompanies you throughout your whole life from birth to death and after death. So it's how people will refer to you once you're dead, although people also use domestic names. Um, so I think birth names um, perhaps have, they differ from other names and there's something more elemental about them. Um, and I think that name tabooing probably has more to do with the anthropological concept of taboo than with pragmatic principles of, of person reference per se. So what I mean by that is um, in-law name avoidance isn't motivated, at this point in time at least, um, by kind of conscious, pragmatic um, assessment of the context that you're in, but rather by something deeper, something more emotional, um, where birth names, you know, they're a taboo object that you don't touch. It's not that names themselves are a problem. Um, but if you guys have any ideas about, about um, what's special about birth names, I'd be very interested to hear. And that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alice. We have yeah, time for questions or comments. Yeah, I was kind of struck by this theory that uh, economy and recognition <laughs> play a role uh, maybe in, in personal reference, but I wonder whether it's useful to look at names under this umbrella, because uh, at least in my research area, everybody gets the name of a dead person, so mm. you know, it's a very small set of names, and, yeah. and hence people need to get multiple names, actually, which I is see, a big I reference, uh -huh. because you know, there are about 120 Hippolytes and uh, Therese, etc. Mm. So, that's have you tried yeah. to separate those two? Mm -hmm. So look at person reference, which is how people use names, and the motivations uh, for people to give names mm -hmm. and different types of names. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really interesting example where you actually have this small set of names. That would be a very good reason to have multiple names. Yeah. In Datoga, that's not the case. So these birth names really can, I mean, there are there is overlap, certainly. Um, there are some common, common names, but they're, they're really, there's an unlimited set of names, I would say. Um, so that explanation wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily work in this case. Um, so I guess that's kind of the conclusion I came to there was actually naming and person reference we might need to treat differently. Um, mm -hmm. but, I, but I haven't looked in huge detail yet at these different types of names and what's... I is this avoiding calling father-in-law father-in-law forever? Mm. 
or good question. <laughs> so, or when they stop being, you know, being able to reproduce mm. today. Yeah, so in the literature on, on other avoidance registers, it's often reported that um, once women pass childbearing age, then um, they can kind of reduce their avoidance patterns. Some Datoga women have told me that too, when a woman has had um, a number of male sons, then she's, then she's okay, she doesn't need to be quite so respectful. But in practice, um, <laughs> <laughs> so other women have told me, no, you do it till you die. And in my own observation, very elderly women still practice avoidance and I think you've got to the point where it's so embedded in your linguistic practice and your habit that actually switching back would be, would be difficult. Um, Yvonne Trice, who's written about the um, Kambata avoidance register, has this nice example where um, women became Christian and they were discouraged from practicing avoidance and one woman found it really, really hard to actually use ordinary words again because she was so used to the avoidance words. I wonder if um, the term that you you had with from Levinson, mm. um, circumspection, yeah. whether that's a principle or rather a mechanism um, that just is a grab bag of other principles. Um, for example, of taboo avoidance, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but it can be also, I could imagine, um, things like shared experience. Um, mm. I call this person stinky because yeah. we went on a camping trip once and together and you know throughout he was smelly or didn't yeah. wash or something. Yeah. Um, and people's names change, you know, you have, mm -hmm. a, you have a primary school name and a, and a senior school mm -hmm. name and a university name and, yeah. and you have cohorts of people who would know you by one name yeah. because of certain experiences or whatever. So yeah. I, I think in addition to the socio-centric mm -hmm. and the egocentric, mm -hmm. that is kinship-based and socio-centric-based clan and so on, mm -hmm. there's also uh, experiential-centric yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can play around with those to get all sorts of different mm -hmm. effects. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, um, just I'm just thinking about uh, where I work in Lombok, technonymia is very common, mm -hmm. but it really emphasizes, ah, a 35-year-old male, right? Mm -hmm. But you haven't got a technonym. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. clearly there's something wrong with yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so people will use that to kind of make exactly. a comment. Yeah. A, and yeah. so I, I think circumspection is, is mm -hmm. just a grab bag, mm -hmm. which is the outcome of a bunch of other things that are operating. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you may I wouldn't call it a principle, then, mm -hmm. call it a... So, for Levinson, it's this idea of using a, a more generic class of word, I think, than a name. Um, so it can't really explain the variation in the use of of different kinds of names, but I think you're, you're definitely right about this shared experience um, bringing forth names. So there's lots of really nice examples in the PNG literature. People call each other my cola nut, for example, because they ate a cola nut together. And you know, the other important thing he mentioned is these names will change and potentially quite rapidly, like nicknames. Um, I think one thing about some of this literature is it's it's always on the circumspection avoidance end of the scale and actually there's obviously the intimacy end of the scale too where we're using names to create intimacy between people um, and Michael Silverstein uses the concept of what he calls baptismal event yeah um, which is it may be like you know somebody gets married and therefore as you were telling us the women change their names yeah but it, a whole range of different practices could be mm -hmm. enshrined through naming yeah. and be baptismal events and yeah. stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a question for that. Yeah. Um, do you know if there's any relationship between people and um, the supernatural? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, among Roma, um, the name that the mother gives the child is unknown to uh, evil spirits, mm, yes, um, yeah. and so and there's also so the baptismal name, or depending on the religion, um, sort of a religious name is safe because it's being sanctioned by the spirits, so, so called. Yeah. Um, and then there's also this of uh, having outside outsiders and insiders names. Mm -hmm. So among travellers in this country, 
um, the name that is known to outsiders and not known by insiders. So it means that when the police come, nobody <laughs> knows who they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if there's anything mm -hmm. going on like that. Yeah, so that's something I'm, I'm really interested in. I remember reading um, a similar thing in, in Mongolian. So names are given to babies to protect them from evil spirits. So they're named after ugly things, right, instead of pretty things, because it protects them like an evil spirit wouldn't want to come and take an ugly thing. Um, I've, I've sort of poked into that and inquired a bit. Um, Togo aren't usually named after the dead, so there's no, there's no, I mean, occasionally they'll be named, if there was a really important funeral going on, they might be named after that elder, but it's not, it's not really a, a metaphysical, spiritual connection between the two. Um, and I think that there certainly are some relevant connections. So if you're, um, if you have several babies who die, then you might name, you might take a different strategy of naming the third one, to, or, or, and you definitely wouldn't repeat the name of the of the child because you know you want to protect it from that. Um, but but nothing nothing quite as obvious as your example. I wonder if there's a relation with the, the taboo and um, yes metaphysical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I I'm often trying to look for a, a nice explanation like that about why these birth names are so kind of special and sacred. Is it because you know, they're part of this person's spirit or something. But how do you make an argument for that? I mean, um, it's certainly not something that, that as a Toga person would explain to me in those terms. Um, so it's a very interesting topic. It's a question of how do you get that <coughs> at that, you know? Um, you, you were, seem to be mentioning uh, or of some sort, I'm not sure what you meant, but you pointed out it's a patrilineal society. Mm. Is that distinct from matrilineal societies that you're comparing it with in some way? Or is it um, so, in terms of the avoidance, that matters in the sense that you're, you avoid more male relatives than you do females, but I wasn't drawing any particular... I mean, I think you don't find this kind of near homophone avoidance or... <laughs> I don't know, probably name avoidance in, um, in any matrilineal society. I don't know, I don't have an explanation for that. It's just an observation that these kinds of special avoidance registers are only found in societies where women live with their husband's family and it's a uh, patrilineal descent system. So if you have an explanation for that, then... Well, the, I mean, the one that I live with, because my wife is a Tanzanian, who is certainly in a matrilineal oh, yeah. system. Which I'm rather familiar with. I've been for the last 60 years. 60 years. Um, they always take their names on the much of the video side. Mm -hmm. They have nothing to do with that other name right. at all. Mm -hmm. um, and they're quite, they, they prefer to them by maybe any name, but mm -hmm. I can't perceive of any avoiding the subject mm -hmm. there at all. Really? So I think some, some anthropological literature is looked at if, if it's a matrilineal system then you'll have son-in-law, mother-in-law avoidance as you would expect, whereas if it's patrilineal they have daughter-in-law, father-in-law avoidance. But um, obviously there are exceptions. The only thing that's very clear is that they have these birth names which are absolutely secret. Uh -huh. Yeah, but no, you don't have to avoid your mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no one ever told you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. So I was just wondering, you mentioned earlier about how sometimes uh, names that aren't appropriate for a certain social encounter are used for sort of comic or ironic effect. Mm. Uh, I, I was just wondering, like, how often do you see this happening? Is it quite restricted mm -hmm. for certain kinds of relationships? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, d I don't actually know um, how often it is quantitatively. Um, mm -hmm. I would certainly say that it's only going to be when you're talking to your peers that you can make these kind of jokes. Um, there aren't any formalised joking relationships in Totoga. Um So often in societies where you have this kind of extreme... Um, uh, father-in-law avoidance, you have a a joking relationship on the other side, so your mother's brother is someone that you can joke with. That doesn't, that's not true in this case. 
Um, but yeah, generally, you know, if you're if you're speaking to a senior person, you're well, actually, that's not quite true. So grandparents, you can joke with. So someone of that age and relationship to you, then perhaps you can mess about with names a little bit. Um, but any more formal encounter with elders, you're unlikely to practice yeah, that kind of creativity. Quite rare, and also yeah. with the in-laws, you wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. That. that would be that would be bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I have no examples where a woman ut actually utters the name of her father-in-law. And that would be, I presume, a very transgressive. Sort of yeah, exactly. So um, in my PhD, I looked at. I found that. The breaking the name taboo is really bad. Breaking the, the word taboo, so the word that sounds similar, actually isn't that bad. No one's going to notice. Um, but yeah, to, to say the name of your father-in-law is still it's, you know, shocking to them. Um, and they're appalled if they would hear someone you know, from a different ethnic group do that. Yeah. But um, good question. I mean, that's how those kinds of informal relationships are forged, partly is you know, through joking via person reference or whatever. So what happens if you do? <laughs> so um, if you say someone's name by mistake, you are supposed to bite on your necklace um, to show that you did it unintentionally. So in other societies, you spit. But um, the total women bite on their necklaces. And occasionally, if I really needed to know the name of someone's father-in-law, she would like put her necklace in her mouth and tell me the name through the necklace, and that was OK. Um, I think, you know, if you were purposefully breaking this taboo, you know, you would be sent home to your natal family. Um, but I don't think it happens. I think women are really respectful of this taboo in the main. Yeah. And when they're breaking the, when they actually use words that sound similar, in general, I don't, people don't notice. Maybe when a woman first marries, everyone's kind of <laughs> ready to hear the mistakes. Um, unfortunately, I've never been able to document a, a new wife joining her household um, and her speech patterns. She probably wouldn't be very keen on that. But yeah, people are probably more sensitive at that very initial stage of marriage. Good question. Um, so when, when you're talking about circumspection, mm -hmm. you're kind of talking about the difference between names as a category mm -hmm. and then other words as being less yeah. specific. Yeah. But it seems to me that there's also something within names. Mm -hmm. Like you spoke of the marriage names as being in some ways less specific because there's less of them, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. they're more... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the same with the, the mm -hmm. house names, the yeah. domestic mm -hmm. names. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if there could be something yeah. to that in, yeah. people's cho in people's choice of using a slightly more yeah. generic yeah, name good for point. a taboo. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously a lot more going mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly true that you know, these different types of name have different indexical associations of who uses them and in what context. Mm -hmm. And so a domestic name um, has particular connotations of, well, I, I think probably informality, but also um, being junior a little bit because it's used by children. Uh, but you're right, that's an interesting point. There are any given domestic name, there's probably only five women in the vicinity who, who have that name. So it is less specific in that sense. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I'll think about that. <laughs> yeah? May I ask how this knowledge about names um, is transmitted to, to, to women? Mm -hmm. So when they grow up, and so are there, are, there, are there special occasions when family members sit down mm -hmm. with each other and it's just about teaching yeah. each other the names of the family members? Or yeah. Because I was wondering whether there are cases when you don't know the name of certain uh, members of the family. Yeah, yeah. so um, in some of the other documented cases, there is some a formal occasion in which you're told every single name that you must avoid. In Datoga, um, that's not the case. You might kind of get some informal info from your mother-in-law, um, especially if you say a taboo word, you'll say, no, that's wrong, we don't say that. But there's no, um, there's no time at which they go through you know, the whole genealogy of the, of the, of the husband. Um, but, I, yeah, I have a really nice example. During an interview, um, I'm asking the senior, the senior wife of the household, um, 
who they avoid and she's like oh we also avoid the um, father-in-law's mother's father and the junior wife's like what <laughs> do we well that's stupid why do we do that but she did avoid that word as well because she just was copying the practice of the senior wife so actually she was avoiding something that she didn't even know whose name it related to um, she just knew that she should so you're absolutely right often they won't actually know um, some of these far back relatives why why they're avoiding them um, in terms of the avoidance vocabulary itself, that's just learnt in the course of being a Totoga. So kids know this terminology. Children actually, you know, they spend the most time with their mother. They will sometimes use avoidance words instead of ordinary words because that's what their mother uses. That's the word they might acquire first. And then they're told, you know, that's your mother's word, not your word. Is, is it called something? Is it called avoidance? Because for example, here, I think people practice, um, although they might not sometimes realise, they practice word taboos, but they might not know mm -hmm. what that's called. Maybe academics know that. <laughs> yeah. Like when you say, I'm going to powder my nose, <laughs> that's avoidance. Yeah. This yeah. away, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's not called anything mm -hmm. for the what you call people, the vast majority of people. Yeah. But do they have a... Yeah, although I think people are familiar with like euphemism but um to Toby, yeah they have i didn't actually mention this so there's um a noun gingo shodo which means the practice of avoidance and then um to refer to the language itself there's a related noun gingo esta that refers to the avoidance vocabulary so it's very much they're very much aware of this practice and they can reflect on it um and they can say Actually, in the, the, the example I showed you with Ginyangid, later on the, the woman says something like, um, she says, are you cooking something? And she means, are you brewing something? It's the avoidance word. And the, the guy outside has no idea what she's saying. The guy inside says, she's using Ginyangid, so that it's, it, she means brewing. Um, so yeah, it's something they, they talk about quite openly, have a metapragmatic label for. Whether they... I mean, of course, there's all kinds of other euphemism in the language. Whether they have a term for that, probably not. So, yeah. Can I ask you about the avoidance of the, typical, the typical thing that you get in other avoidance situations is polysemy, mm -hmm. um, one to many replacements. Otherwise, you're having to deal with tens of thousands of yeah. lexemes. Is that true here as well? Um, yeah, to some extent. So. Um, not like Dixon's example, but um, yeah, so there might be like one equivalent for names of trees, <coughs> names of trees, um, things like that, but not on the scale that you see in some of the Australian um, avoidance registers where you really have a reduced avoidance vocabulary. It's, it's well, pretty. Some, some of them have one. Yeah. They just have one word, yeah. which is. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's not like that at all. Um, so I've so far got 650 words of avoidance. So it's um, you know not on the scale of the ordinary vocabulary, but it's still pretty large. Yeah. Can I ask a yeah. question? Is there a one-to-one -one mapping between who you would use this avoidance register with and other strategies? So like eye contact, not being in a room with, mm -hmm. not being yeah, oh, right. and various other kind of ways that plays out? No, because, so you avoid this huge set of people that I showed you linguistically, but the only person, so your mother-in-law, I think you ideally wouldn't touch her, no. but it wouldn't be a big deal if you did, and you can certainly sit with her, and you know, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law have, have a pretty relaxed relationship compared to the father-in-law, yeah. so the kind of non-linguistic avoidance um, doesn't map onto the linguistic avoidance. So the, the most extreme avoidance is for father-in-law, he's really the prototypical person. Um, and then you would also physically avoid his brothers, his immediate brothers. Um, but having said that, I did find that actually people made more of an effort to linguistically avoid father-in-law than they did mother-in-law, for example. So you do see some um, kind of a do, a different degrees of avoidance that reflect also that non-linguistic non avoidance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just, just because you had the photo and my daughter is not here, I will oh. ask a bad gesture. <laughs> um, I kind of as an extension of Hannah's question is that, I mean, we have 
conscious, if not actually enacted, avoidance of directly pointing yeah. people yeah. in generally in Western mm -hmm. culture. Is yeah. there a similar thing happening? Um, so I've been told that pointing is rude. Yeah, by deterrent speakers. Um, and I certainly... So that particular photo, he was pointing, and that was obviously fine in that particular situation, but probably it wasn't like, you know. Um, so yeah, I think pointing is quite taboo. Yeah. So you can't point to somebody instead of saying their name? Oh, well, that would be handy if you could, but um, <laughs> that okay, person. Could be you could maybe use a different part of your body, right? Because you could, there are grid gradations in pointing, right? Like if you used a whole hand as opposed to a finger, it's better. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Not that I've spotted. There were some more hands In the clip you showed, I was a bit confused because is the woman not looking outside? No, she's she's sitting in um, the next room, which is not open to the outside. Oh, Sorry. Yeah, wasn't. that was quite quite important. So she couldn't see the person. And they also couldn't hear each other very well. Yeah. Is there a reason she stayed in the room? Or is it just she didn't want to get up? Um, so in some cases, it would women would want to sit separately. Those were her two quite close relatives, so there was no reason for her to be in there, really. I think she might have been cooking or something, yeah. I'm, I'm curious um, if you said that there's words for this practice, and I'm wondering if people talk about it and if anybody has rejected this practice in the community that mm. you work mm -hmm. in, or if it's... Uh, yeah, operate. so there is, there is some change. Um, so more educated to Toga, and especially those who've converted to Christianity no longer practice avoidance okay. they do still avoid the names of I think at least father-in-law that is still taboo but I think that's quite standard in other you know other languages too um, as for I mean most of the women I talk to I I get the impression they still really value it um, mm -hmm. if they talk about other ethnic groups who don't do it that's you know they have a very negative view of that um, but I do wonder if it's decreasing in use. So I noticed a lot of the families I work with only avoided two generations rather than the full three generations. And I don't know whether that's a sign of change or whether there was always that kind of variation. Um, I mean, no doubt it will disappear. No doubt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just curious, um, you mentioned that the Christian community is quite religious. If people, yeah. are, if people are, you know, if there's a census or people yeah. need a passport or yeah. something, what, yeah. what happens? Yeah, absolutely. So one of my um, my best consultants works at a, a hospital and, and this completely, I mean, yeah, it's really problematic because a woman can't say where she lives because it's the name of her father-in-law's house. So um, usually other people will speak for her. Um, but more and more they, they will just have to put the beans in the mouth and, and, and say these names. Absolutely, yeah, it, is, it doesn't work very well. So it? how would they be listed in the register? Which, which name would be chosen for them? Um, is there any pattern to that? So a woman, I think, it's difficult. So men, it's very straightforward. It's your birth name, your father's name, and your clan name. With women, it's, um, I think it would probably be your, in a kind of hospital setting, your first name and then your... It might be your husband's name if he has his own compound, in which case there's no problem. Or it'll be your father-in-law's name because he's the owner of the compound. So that's where the problem will start. So she can't say that, that name. Um, yeah. And, and then other, other contexts, I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, absolutely, it will have implications. I'll just tell you a little anecdote. I had a, a Balinese student and in Bali, people are named by, there are five birth order names, and then you have a personal name. Okay. And he and his wife turned up at immigration with a baby, and he was Bayan Arka, his wife was Kutu Artini, and the child was uh, Kutu Tagara. No, they didn't share a single name in common. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah, yeah, very worried yeah, 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 yeah. about yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe one last, yeah, one last. Um, if, if, if there is a transgression, um, who is more likely to admonish the person for doing it? Would it be a woman 
Mm. I don't have any natural data on that, um, but I think it would be mother-in-law. She's kind of responsible for daughter-in-law, so, yeah. Yeah, I think we could probably continue this conversation <laughs> for a lot longer. There's a very rich talk, uh, but um, maybe we can continue the conversation in our true tradition of going across the Institute of Education, and I encourage you all to join us. And uh, before we do, just to thank Alice once again for a very interesting talk.